Good morning, family. This is Pastor Khalil Rogers, Senior Pastor of the Pinal Baptist Church, located in the heart of North Philly. Thank you guys once again for joining us on it this Sunday morning. It is our communion Sunday, uh, so uh, you can give yourself some time to get, get things together. Uh, you can do that now if you like. You can do it after the fact. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, a Sunday that we partake of the Lord's Supper. Um, I pray that you and your families are healthy. I pray that you are safe. I pray that you are well. I pray that uh, all of you had a nice holiday weekend last weekend, and I pray that um, you're enjoying your weekend this weekend. I pray that you are enjoying your life. I pray that you are um, holding fast to the standard of Jesus Christ. And I pray that you are just in a good space. I miss you guys. I love you guys. And I hope to see you very soon. Do me a favor. Hit like and share. Hit like and share. Hit like and share. We want this thing to go viral. We're in. Uh, we're finishing up Philippians 1 today. We're finishing up Philippians chapter 1 today. We're in verse number 27. Verse number 27, Philippians chapter 1, verse number 27. Uh, this is sermon number 5 in our series, A Journey to Joy. Sermon number 5. Just one thing, as citizens of heaven, live your life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or am absent, I will hear about you. That you are standing firm in one spirit, in one accord, contending together for the faith of the gospel not being frightened in any way by your opponents. This is a sign of destruction for them, but of your salvation. And this is from God. For it has been granted to you on Christ's behalf, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. And since you are engaged in the same struggle that you saw I had, and now hear that I had. That's the end of chapter one. I want to use as a thought today, crucifying the Lone Ranger Christian. Crucifying the Lone Ranger Christian. Father, move me out of your way. Hide me behind the cross where Jesus is the center of all attraction. Make me a humble waiter to serve up your bread to your people. I pray, Father God, that folks are encouraged. I pray that people will be enlightened, that they will be exhorted. I pray that those who are lost will be evangelized and that they will receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord today. May I preach with power. May I preach with conviction. May I preach accurately, be theologically sound and culturally relevant. For it's in your name I pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Crucifying the Lone Ranger Christian. Many of you are familiar with the TV show back in the day, The Lone Ranger. For those of you who are not familiar, The Lone Ranger is an American Western drama TV series that aired on ABC in the late 40s and early 50s with Clayton Moore in the starring role in Jay uh, Silverhills, a member of the Mohawk Aboriginal people in Canada played the Lone Ranger's Indian companion, Tonto. <clears throat> the premise of the show is a group of six Texas Rangers are ambushed and are all shot and believed to be dead. And in the hot sun, one lives and crawls to a pool of cool water, which saves his life. He is found by a native Indian, Tonto, who buries the five other Rangers one of whom is the survivor's brother. Tonto tends to his health and complies with his wish to make a mask from his brother's clothes and to create an empty sixth grave to make it look like that he is dead. The Lone Ranger uh, survives and disguises himself with the black mask that Tonto, his Indian uh, companion, had made for him. And he travels with Tonto throughout Texas and throughout the American West to fight against criminals and outlaws. That's, that's the story of the Lone Ranger. Very popular show back in the day. 
Now, many people believe that this fictional story of the Lone Ranger is based off of a real person, a black man named Bass Reeves. Bass Reeves, um, who, who was around back in the slave days, um, but who was, who was actually a slave and, and um, freed himself, beat up his master and, and escaped from slavery, um, lived through July um, 1838 through January uh, 12, 1910. But he was an American uh, law enforcement officer. He's the first black deputy U.S. Marshal west of the Mississippi River. Bass Reeves was a bad man. He, he worked mostly in Arkansas and the Oklahoma Territory. And during his long career, he had on his record more than 3,000 arrests. This one man by himself, more than 3,000 arrests of dangerous criminals and shot and killed at least 14 of them in an alleged self-defense. Bass Reeves was the real Lone Ranger. What is a Lone Ranger? A Lone Ranger is one who acts without consultation or the approval of others in a broad sense. A Lone Ranger is one who does everything by themselves. They go at the task alone. They, they, they don't need any help, so they think. They, they are a team of one. They don't believe that they need the help of others to accomplish their goals. Lone Rangers do what they want, when they want, and how they want. And unfortunately, our churches are full of Lone Ranger Christians. Christians who believe that it's them against the world and they don't need nobody else. Christians who proudly sing, as long as I got King Jesus, I, I don't need nobody else. Let me wreck somebody's theology on this Sunday morning. There is nothing biblical about that song. When, when God saved us, we were adopted into his family and he intends for his body, his family, the church to work together. Outside of our personal quiet time that we spend with God in prayer, that we spend with God in devotion and our own personal study and meditation and fasting, everything else we do in the Christian life is done in community. We, we, we got too many Lone Ranger Christians in our churches, and we need to crucify the Lone Ranger mentality. We got Lone Ranger churches who won't work with other churches. We got Lone Ranger pastors who won't work with other pastors. We got Lone Ranger ministry leaders who won't work with other ministry leaders. We got Lone Ranger preachers who won't work with or support other preachers. In fact, they are only excited about worship when they're the one who got the mic. We, we got Lone Ranger deacons. We got Lone Ranger ushers, youth men, workers, singers, praise dancers, minds, poets, and lay people. We got too many Lone Ranger Christians in the body of Christ, and we need to crucify the spirit. There's no room in the kingdom for the Lone Ranger mentality. We, we, we are all in this together. This is what Paul is talking about here in these few verses. But contextually, many of you who, who have not been with us, let me lay out chapter one for you again. After telling us of the characteristics of the Christian in verses one to two, after telling us the fellowship we have as Christians in verses three through eight, and after making a petition to pray for us as Christians in verses nine through 11, and after telling us that he finds joy in knowing that Christ is preached where we were last week in verses 12 to 27, here in verse, or here, um, in verses 12 through 26, I'm sorry, here in verse 27, Paul uh, teaches us that there is no room for long range of Christians. He says, right in verse 27, just one thing as citizens of heaven, live your life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or am absent, I will hear about that you are standing firm in one spirit in one accord, contending together for the faith of the gospel. I hope you're in your Bible. First thing Paul tells us is that uh, what we fight for. He teaches us what we fight for. We should be striving, Paul says, for the faith of the gospel. We need to stand fast and strive together because all, all of us have the same conflict. 
We need to strive and fight together because all of us have the same conflict. We in the same fight. Writing to the Thessalonian church in 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 and 4, Paul says, For our exhortation didn't come from error or impurity or an intent to deceive. Instead, just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please people, but rather God who examines our hearts. Paul is saying that the gospel standard has been placed in our hands as God's army. And it's our job to plant the gospel flag in our homes, in our churches, in our communities, and in our neighborhoods, both near and far. This is what we are fighting for as Christians. We, we have been given a privilege and a responsibility to strategically live our lives worthy of the gospel. In the military, this is called a strategic front. Paul calls the church to carry the fight to the points of influential life. We're, we're, we're called to carry this fight to the penthouse, to the projects, our private spaces, and in the public square. We have been given the privilege to strategically capture the lost souls of men, women, and children with the unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ. As the prophet Isaiah said, so that a little one shall become a thousand. This is how we're going to win back our streets, family. It's not by political power or with the almighty dollar, dollar, but only by God's spirit. What's the solution for what's going on in our streets? Why, why are things so bad? So bad? What, what are we going to do? What is the solution? What is the response? It's the same solution that God gave us two, over 2,000 years ago. Jesus Christ told us what the solution is. Go ye therefore. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Holy Spirit. That, 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 that's the solution. That's the mission. Uh, the, the solution is to take the gospel message and the love of Christ to one soul at a time. You, we got so much hatred in our streets. How you, uh, how you going to combat that? The only way to combat it is with the gospel. We, we have to fight for that one soul to be saved in our home. You have to strive for that one soul to be saved on your job. You got to struggle for that one soul to be saved in your community. You got to suffer for that one soul to be saved in your school. We, we, we shouldn't be sold out for the American flag. We, we should be sold out for the gospel flag. We, we shouldn't be resting our hope on old glory. We should be resting our hope on the old rugged cross that Jesus was crucified from, crucified from and buried, but then rose again on the third day Christians walking around singing old oh, glory that praising a flag what kind of Christian are you maybe you're not a Christian at all maybe you're just a churchian we got to plant the gospel flag and advance the kingdom in the world that this isn't an easy task and I know that because nothing God ever told us to do is easy if it's easy then it didn't come from God. Let me say that again. If, if it's easy, more than likely, chances are, didn't come from God. Nothing God tells us to do is easy in a word. Husbands, love your wives. Oh, I can do that. <laughs> okay. But as Christ loved the church, a lot tougher. That, that, that ain't easy. Wives, submit. Oh, I can submit to your own husbands. Ooh. As unto the Lord, that, that's not so easy. Children, obey your parents. Even when your parents ain't perfect, even when your parents ain't cool, even when your parents is wrong, you still obey them and honor them. That ain't easy. Love your neighbor as yourself. Oh, I can do that. My neighbor is nice. What about the mean ones? What about the nasty ones? What about the racist ones? Ah, uh, not, not so easy. Love your enemies. Ah, uh, we, we know that ain't easy. Bless those who curse you. Huh? Pray for those who spitefully use you. That ain't easy. Obey the governing authorities that God has allowed to be in charge over you. Romans 13, that ain't easy. Nothing that God is telling us to do is easy, nor will it be easy for us to win souls for Christ. Because the enemy is fighting like hell to keep what he believes belongs to him. Let me say that again. The enemy is fighting like hell 
to keep what he believes belongs to him. This is why things are going so haywire now. This is why the violence is getting worse all over our country and all over the world because the enemy knows that his time is up and he is becoming more aggressive. That, that's, that's, that's what you see happening. That's what you see played out. The scripture says it was going to happen and it's happening right now. When you decide that you're going to be active in advancing the kingdom, the enemy will concentrate all his forces to prevent you from doing that. He'll attack your mind so that you'll begin to doubt your faith. He'll attack your mind so that you'll begin to mess over your own family. He'll attack your mind so that you'll begin to mess up your own finances. He'll attack your mind so that you'll be able to destroy all your relationships. He'll attack your health or the health of your loved ones. He'll use your family, your friends, your church, folks on your job, politicians and your leaders, those who you thought had your best interests at heart. He'll use all those folks against you. That's why Paul says, I will hear about you, that you are standing firm in one spirit and one accord, contending together for the faith of the gospel. That's why we can't have no long range of Christians, because you, you're fighting against an enemy, <clears throat> an enemy who is well organized and been at it much longer than you. You can't go up against him by yourself. We're in this together. The church should be striving together. This is a requirement. It's a requirement. It's a requirement for us as the church to stand our ground in the face of his attacks. This is deeper than just being happy in Jesus. This is more than just reciting a canned prayer that you heard in Sunday school. You have to get into the ring and wrestle with the enemy for the sake of those you love. Remember how God had to wrestle to save Jacob's soul. He had to wrestle for Jacob's soul. Uh, many of you know this passage, or you should know this passage, those of us for now, because that's where we get the name of our church from. Uh, Genesis 32, uh, verse 24 says, Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. And when the man saw that he could not defeat him, he struck Jacob's hip socket as they wrestled and dislocated his hip. Then he said to Jacob, let me go for this daybreak. But Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. It, 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 it was here at the place called Peniel, which we call Penal, uh, face of God, that, that Jacob receives not only the name Israel, but also receives his salvation. The Lord had to literally fight for Jacob's soul. This is why Paul says you have to stand firm in one spirit and on one accord and with one mind, striving together because we share the same conflict. We are fighting the same fight. The illustration here is a military marching together. This is this is the imagery that Paul is is is, is putting out. Not, not one uh, shoulder out of place, all in the same cadence, lockstep together, shoulder to shoulder, for the entire world to see. A united front. Zephaniah three nine says it this way: For I will then restore pure speech to the peoples. So that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve him with a single purpose. You can't present a united front when you're a long range of Christian. You can't present a united front when you are a long ranger Christian doing your own thing. I don't care what regiment of the army you belong to. If you are a Christian, you belong to God's army first. I don't care if you're Anglican. I don't care if you're a Congregationalist. I don't care if you're Baptist. I don't care if you're Methodist. I don't care if you're Presbyterian. I don't care if you're Episcopalian. I don't care if you're AME. I don't care if you're AME Zion. I don't care if you're Kajic, Pentecostal, Seventh Day Adventist, Holiness, non denominational. If you are a blood washed believer, if you are a Christian, you are in God's army, and we all are fighting the same thing. We are all fighting for the same thing. We are all in the same fight and we all have the same captain. Joshua 5, 13 says, when Joshua was there, Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua approached him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, I have now come as a commander of the Lord's army. That, that, that's, that's how we need to be. We ain't fighting on the side of the left or the right. <laughs> we're, we're on the side of the, I'm on the Lord's side. Are, are you a Republican or Democrat? I ain't neither of them. I ain't neither one of them. They're flawed. I, I'm on the Lord's side. 
John chapter uh, 17, 21, it says, May they all be one as you. Father, are, um, may they all be one as you. Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. Family, we ain't got no more time to waste fighting against each other, bickering against each other. We have to strive to fight together for the faith of the gospel. Paul tells us what we fight for. But he also tells us in the same verse 27, who we fight with. He tells us what we fight for, but he also tells us who we fight with. Look at the verse again. Just one thing, as citizens of heaven, live your life worthy of the gospel of Christ. That's what you're fighting for. Then, whether I come and see you or am absent, I will hear about you that you are standing firm in one spirit, in one accord, contending together for the faith of the gospel. We, we, we fighting together. That's what we fighting with. We fighting with each other. We're, we're, we're together. We're on the same team, not fighting against each other, but, but we're fighting together. We ain't in this by ourselves. We are all in this together. This is why we, we have to get rid of the Lone Ranger Christian mentality. It is a united front, and we are all members of the army of God fighting for the same cause. This is why you can't be no punk and be a Christian. Can't be no punk to be a Christian. To be a Christian is to represent the counterculture, and you can't be soft to do that. You have to be willing to tick some people off. Your walk with Christ should be offensive to the world. You ain't supposed to be trying to fit in with folks who are on their way to hell. You have to be unapologetic in your walk with Christ. They won't like it, and many won't like you, but they will respect you. Just think this through. What would the church look like? If we decided that we're really going to work together instead of competing with each other, what would it look like? What, what, what if we crucified the Lone Ranger Christian mentality? What if there were no more divisions and schisms within the body? What if everything we did, we did it together with pure motives? What, what if there was, um, what if we weren't so quarrelsome? Um, what if we didn't treat each other different based on titles and status or positions in the church? What, what if there were no superiority complexes? What, what if everybody really were seen as equals? What, what if we got rid of all the titles and the only one we kept is servant? Because that's the, that's, that's, <laughs> that's the only one that's going to matter at the end of the day. That, that's, that's what all these fancy titles mean anyway. Pastor, bishop, all, all, man, all these titles suggest that you should be serving. What if there was no more selfishness and, and self-seeking gratification? Don't tell me it ain't possible. I know it is because it's all in the scripture. Um, that's what the Bible is calling us to do. So I, if God is telling us to do it, he wouldn't tell us to do it if it was impossible for us to do. What if we did it? We'd have more time uh, to fight for the souls of men, women, and children. If we weren't busy fighting against each other. If we wasn't busy um, being mad at each other, if we weren't busy competing with one another, we, we, we'd have more time to fight together for the lost souls of men, women, and children in our communities. We'd have more time to fight against the ills of society. You'll have more time to fight against, if people want to fight against abortion, all right, you'll have more time to deal with that. That's a personal issue, by the way, but we'll have more time to deal with real stuff. We, we'd have more time to, to fight against Mass incarceration and modern day slavery. We, we'd have more time to fight against militarized policing. We'd have more time to fight against racial profiling. We'll have more time to fight against police brutality. We'd have more time to fight against racist stand your ground laws. We'd have more time to fight against racist stop and frisk laws. We'd have more time to fight against um, unequitable wages. We'd have more time to fight against the educational disparities. We'd have more time to fight against poor access to health care. We'd have more time to fight against voter suppression. We'd have more time to fight against white supremacy. We'd have more time to fight against mistreatment of undocumented immigrants. We'd have more time to fight against the black on black genocide that's going on in our streets. Paul tells us what we fight for. He also tells us who we fight with. But also, he tells us who we fight against. Ah, 
It's right there in verse 28. This is what we're fighting against. He says, not being frightened in any way by your opponents. The young, the young folk in the street call them your ops. Yeah, that's my ops, man. That, not being frightened in any way by your opponents. This is a sign of destruction for them, but of your salvation. And this is from God. Don't be afraid of your adversaries. Don't be afraid of your enemies. In fact, you need to expect to have some enemies since you are a citizen of heaven. That's what it says. It says you're a citizen of heaven in the text. And if you're a citizen of heaven, what makes you think you're not going to have enemies with citizens of hell? <laughs> if you are truly um, a kingdom citizen, that means that you got some enemies. You got at least three of them. If you're a Christian, at least three, the world, that's your external enemy, the flesh, that's your internal enemy and the devil himself. That's your infernal enemy. Whenever you engage in kingdom work, you better believe you will get the enemy's attention. <clears throat> Whenever you decide to advance the flag of the faith, there will be enemies who, whether knowingly or unknowingly, are under the direction of the chief enemy of our souls. Satan himself. If everybody likes you, that's a problem. If life is always easy for you, that's a problem. If everything is always a walk in the park for you, that's a problem. If you just praising and shouting your way through everything, that's a problem. In the Christian life, there are seasons of praise. There are seasons of joy, but there are also seasons of lament. There are seasons of grief, sorrow, anger, frustration, disappointment, and heartache. All of that is captured in the Christian experience. It's not just a whole shout praise party. You don't get that until we get to heaven. <laughs> but down here in the land of the living, you're going to experience all of those things. Every moment isn't a shouting moment. Every attack can't be handled by the lamb. Some attacks require the lion. John Calvin said that the pastor ought to have two voices, one for gathering the sheep and another for driving away the wolves. These opponents or adversaries, Paul mentions in verse 28, are the tools and instruments of Satan. Paul was familiar with having enemies and experiencing pain and loss as a result of them. You remember in Acts chapter 16, um, um, in verse 19, where it says when this, this is a girl who was caught up in um, in witchcraft and sorcery, and, and she was basically being used and pimped and prostituted. She was being exploited. And and, and Paul and, and them delivered this girl, and her owners get upset. They get mad because he messing up their money. So in verse 19, it says, when her owners realized that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. Bringing them before the chief magistrates, that's the judges, they did took on the court. And they said, these men are seriously disturbing our city. They are Jews and are promoting customs that are not legal for us as Romans to adopt or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against them and the chief magistrates stripped off their clothes and ordered them to be beaten with rods. So Y'all think thought police brutality was something new. Nope, been going on a long time. After they had severely flogged them. That means beat them, like with a whip. They threw them in jail and ordering the jailer to guard them carefully, put, put them in solitary confinement. And receiving such an order, he put them into the inner prison. That's the hole. <laughs> and, and secured their feet in stocks. Ah. Paul, Paul practiced what he preached. That's how he was able to preach with authority. That's why he's locked up in Philippi. Locked up in a Roman jail now. Um, that's how he was able to, to preach with authority and encourage the believers to not be afraid of their opponents because he practiced what he preached. The word frightened in verse 28, it, it literally mean, means to be terrified. And, and the idea is to be alarmed. It's like to be caught off guard. Uh, imagine a horse that's running wild because it got scared because it was caught off guard. Something, you know, spooked it and it just ran off. That's what Paul's saying. He's saying, don't be afraid of anything that the enemy is capable of doing because whatever he's doing, he is doing it from a place of defeat. The devil is a defeated foe. <laughs> he, 
He is a defeated foe. Hallelujah, somebody. Don't allow the enemy to have you walking around on eggshells with his threats. Instead, seek God's grace and stand firm with purpose. Let me tell you why you shouldn't be afraid of your enemy, just in case you're wondering. Romans 16, 20 says that the God of peace will soon crush Satan, your enemy, under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Get that verse in your spirit. Romans 16, 20. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Talking to you, believer. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. It's talking to Christians. A child of God ain't got no business whatsoever being afraid of the enemy or the weapons of his warfare. You have to count it a privilege to suffer for Christ. Knowing that the cross the enemy nails you to today will be a crown tomorrow. Your steadfastness is evidence that your enemies will be destroyed. That's why Paul says in verse 28, not being frightened in any way by your opponents. This is a sign of destruction for them, but of your salvation. And this is from God. Don't be afraid of the enemies of the gospel. People are attacking the church left and right. They're attacking the gospel left and right. They, they trying to, they're attacking the Bible left and right. Attacking Christianity left and right. So making up all these lies, this outlandish foolishness about the faith. Don't be afraid of them. Don't duck them. Don't hide from them. That's why I'm teaching you this book. That's why I've been teaching you how to study your Bible. That's why I've been teaching you how to, how to be apologetic and stand uh, on the promises of God and knowing what the word says so that you can be fearless in the face of opposition. This fearlessness in the face of opposition has a twofold meaning. First, it's a prophecy of destruction to those who fight against God. That, that's what he says here in verse uh, 28. But secondly, it is a sign of salvation. He also says this in verse 28. It's a sign of salvation to those who don't cower in fear because of the enemy. That's you or not. Salvation here in this text um, is used in a, salvation just means to deliver. All right. Um, but it's used here in a future sense. Uh, referring to the eventual deliverance of the saints of God from the trials and redemption of our spirit, soul, and bodies because trouble don't last always. That's basically what Paul is saying here. Soon and very soon, you will be delivered from every trial, every tribulation, every dark hour, every gr every um, grieving moment, all sorrow, all hurt, all pain, all sickness, all death. Soon and very soon, you're going to be delivered from all that. All right? So, so, don't, so don't be afraid of your enemies. You're running a fixed race. Your, your stop resistance in the face of your opposition and persecution is a warning to your enemies that their time is up. This is why this is why the enemy is so aggressive now because he knows game about to be over, homie. The, the devil and his demonic hierarchy are about to be destroyed forever. The devil knows that. <clears throat> he knows his, his time is up because he knows his word. He knows what his future holds and he knows what your, yours holds. Don't you dare be afraid of him. Don't you be af afraid uh, of those who work for him either, whether knowingly or unknowingly. Don't you dare be afraid of no racists ducking and hiding from them. They're cowards. Don't you dare be afraid of no white supremacists. Don't you dare be afraid of no neo-Nazi. Don't you dare be afraid of no crooked cops. I'm sick of people talking, oh, oh you know, the, the cow, the, these, these police out here. Yeah, all right, yeah, it's a lot of bad ones out here, but I ain't, what you scared of them for? He's supposed to be scared of nothing. Don't you dare be afraid of these little urban terrorists on our streets. Don't you dare be afraid of corrupt governments. Don't you dare be afraid of a violent army. Don't you dare be afraid of sickness. Don't you dare be afraid of death. Don't you dare be afraid of witches and warlocks. Don't you dare be afraid of no pagan. Don't you dare be afraid of no demons. And don't you dare be afraid of no devil. Because soon and very soon, our enemies will be destroyed in hell. This is what Paul said. Ain't me making it up. Pastor, you're preaching hard. No, the text is harsh. Look, not being frightened in any way by your opponents, this is a sign of destruction for them. That's in the Bible. They're going to be destroyed. It's true. The devil roams the earth like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But by faith, the church has the lion heart of Christ, who is the lion of the tribe of Judah, according to the book of Revelation. Be fearless in your Christ-likeness. 
When you're fearless in the face of the enemy, even though he's attacking you, that's going to be a sign to him that he's already defeated. See, ain't nothing. I don't know about you, but if you, <laughs> you ever been in a fight. I, I, I've been in a lot of fights in my life growing up in West Philly. You got, you got to learn how to fight, fist fight. All right, we, wasn't, we ain't do it with guns. We wasn't shooting each other. We was doing it with these back in the day, right? Um, and you ever hit somebody with your hardest punch and they just look at you like, that's all you got? And then what happened to me before, I punched this dude in the face, the, hard, the hardest shot I had back in the day. And the dude just looked at Roman basketball court, right in Sarah Playground, uh, the schoolyard on 58th Street. Punched this dude right in his face. He turned around and looked at me like, like a mosquito just bit him on his jaw. And then started walking towards me. Man, the fear of God was in me. I ain't going to tell you the rest of that. <laughs> but, but that's what it's like here. When the enemy gives you his best shot, and you that's the best you got, that's going to be a sign to him that he's done. That's going to be a sign to him that he's already defeated. When you ain't running from him no more. When you ain't afraid of his attacks. You want to beat your enemy, you attack his weakness. But if you want to break your enemy, you attack his strength. Christ didn't just defeat the enemy. He broke the enemy when he suffered, bled, died, and rose again on the third day with all power in his hands. All we have to do is have faith in Christ and the cross of Calvary. And our enemy will run cowering in fear. It's not us who defeated the enemy. Christ did. So we need to have faith in Christ when dealing with our enemies and our opposition. You remember, it wasn't David who crushed Goliath. It was God who crushed Goliath. First Samuel 17, 46 says, Today the Lord will, the Lord will hand you over to me. <laughs> Today I'll strike you down, remove your head, and give the corpses of the Philistine camp to the birds of the sky and the wild creatures of the earth. And then all the world will know that Israel has a God. And this whole assembly will know that it is not by sword or by spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's and he will hand you over to us. It ain't going to be you that's defeating the enemy. It's God who already defeated him. David understood that. David used a rock, a slingshot with a rock to crush Goliath. And you and I have the rock <laughs> to destroy our enemy. Paul tells us what we fight for. He tells us who we fight with. He tells us who we fight against. But lastly, and I'm done, he also tells us who we fight for. He tells us what we fight for. He tells us who we fight with. He tells us who we fight against. But he also tells us who we fight for. Verse 29. For it has been granted to you on Christ's behalf. Because that's who you're fighting for. Not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. This is who you're doing it for. Since you are engaged in the same struggle that you saw I had and now hear that I have. All soldiers are required to wear a uniform when engaged in battle so that they can distinguish themselves from the enemy and their friends and allies will know that they're on the same team. But the soldier also wears a uniform to remind themselves who they are fighting for just in case they forget. As Christians, we also have a uniform that we have to wear each and every day. The book of Ephesians chapter six tells us finally be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. Put on what? The full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. Go back to verse 27 here in Philippians one. He says just one thing as citizens of heaven, live your life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whenever I come and see you or am absent, I will hear about you, that you are standing firm in one spirit and one accord, contending together for the faith of the gospel. The first part of that verse has to do with our behavior and conduct as Christians. It, it would be strange for a soldier to fight a country's battle wearing 
the enemy's uniform. Imagine you being in the military for the United States military. I don't care which branch of the service you're in. But you you fighting the battle for America and you wearing uh, a Russian uniform. You wearing Chinese uh, military regalia. That, that would be really strange. That would be bizarre. That would be unacceptable. Well, as Christians, it's unacceptable for us to wear any other uniform but the uniform of Christ. As Christians, we must be sure that we take off the old uniform of the world, the flesh, and the devil and put on the new clothes of Christ. Pastor, what old clothes? What clothes are you talking about? I got on clean clothes. Uh, maybe you don't. Maybe you still uh, got on that old garment of lying. You got to take it off. You, you got to take off that old habit of sexual immorality. I'm talking about Christians. You got to take off that old habit of drunkenness. You got to take off them old clothes of drug abuse. Take off them old clothes of gossip. Take off that old uniform of cheating. Take off those old clothes of addictive behavior, um, addictive gambling. Take off that old habit of self-hatred. Take off those old habits of racism and bigotry. Take off those old habits of, of selfishness and greed. Take off those old habits of the street life and gang culture. Take off the enemy's clothes. You're a child of God now. It's time for you to get dressed in his clothes. It's time for you to put on his uniform. It's time for you to put on new garments of godliness. Ephesians 4 says, but that is not how you came to know Christ. Assuming you heard about him and were taught by him as the truth is in Jesus to take off your former way of life, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires, that's talking about the flesh, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness and righteousness and purity of truth. Therefore, putting away lying, speak the truth, each one to his neighbor, because we are members of one another. Be angry and sin not. Don't let the sun go down on your anger and don't give the devil an opportunity. Let the thief no longer steal. Instead, he is to do honest work with his own hands so that he has something to share with anyone in need. No foul language should come from your mouth but only what is good for building up someone in need so that it gives grace to those who hear. And don't grieve God's Holy Spirit. You were sealed by him for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and anger and wrath and shouting and slander be removed from you along with all malice and be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another just as God also forgave you in Christ. Paul is saying you got to put on the gospel of love. You got to put on the gospel of peace. You got to put on the gospel of power. You got to get dressed in the gospel of heaven. You got to put on the gospel of Christ. He tells us why we got to crucify the long range of Christian because we're in this together. He tells us what we fight for. Never forget who we fight with. Never forget who we fight against and never forget who we fight for. As I close, it's a privilege to suffer for Christ as well as to believe in him. It's a privilege to suffer for Christ as well as believe in him. Dr. Griffith John wrote that once when he was surrounded by a hostile heathen crowd, he was beaten. And he put his hand to his face, and when he withdrew it, he saw that it was bathed in blood. He was possessed by an extraordinary sense of exaltation. And he rejoiced that he had been counted worthy to suffer for Christ's name. The privilege of suffering for Christ has been granted to us since we are engaged in the same kind of conflict which Paul experienced when the church saw him while he was in Philippi. And it's the same conflict you and I are still waging. As long as we're in the land of the living, we're gonna be in a fight and we can't go at it alone. That's why we have to crucify the Lone Ranger Christian because we are all in this together. God bless you and God keep you in Jesus' name. You may be watching and you may not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. 
If you want to receive him as Savior and Lord of your life, I'll tell you right now, you need to receive him as Lord and Savior of your life. Jesus is the only way. There is no other way to the Father but through the Son, according to Scripture. I believe the Bible. That's what I preach. This is the um, authority of my life in terms of how I live, my conduct, speech, my actions. I'm a kingdom citizen, so, so this is what I go by. Um, and I would encourage you to receive Christ as Savior and Lord of your life. I implore you, I beg you even, to give him your heart. But it's only something that you can do. Um, no one can do it for you. We can only present Christ to you. I can only pray that you receive him, but ultimately it's a decision that you have to make. And Christ does not force himself on you and nobody else can. Only thing we can do is share the message of the gospel, which is what you just heard. So if you want to receive Jesus as Savior and Lord of your life, you're like, yo, that's me. I, I want to receive him. I, I submit. I surrender. I want to give him my life, but I don't know how to do it. Just a simple prayer. And I'll lead you to him right now. Bow with me. And believe in your heart and confess these words with your mouth. Repeat after me. Father, I confess. I confess. That I'm a sinner. I confess that I need you in my life. I ask you to come into my heart and save me. I confess that Jesus is Lord. I confess that um, he died on the cross for my sin, but rose again on the third day. I believe in you. And I confess my need for you. Save me right now in the name of Jesus. Make me the person you want me to be. Give my life purpose. Give my life meaning. Give me a mission. I'm tired of being a lone ranger, just living life on my own terms. I want to be adopted into a holy family, an eternal family, a family that's never going to be separated, a family that's never going to be neglected by, the, by its father. A rich family, a wealthy family, with a lot of great brothers and sisters. Save me, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, I want to welcome you to the body of Christ. And I would like to offer you the Pinal Baptist Church family as a church home. We're located on 25th and Jefferson in the heart of North Philly. Our building is still closed. It will be open soon. I know I keep saying that. It's like you know, a broken record, but we'll get there. But you don't have to wait until the building opens back up to join. You can go to our website, www.pinalbaptistchurch.org, and you can send us your contact information, email, and a phone number and your name. That's all we need. And tell us that you would like to join the Pinal Baptist Church, and you can join virtually. And then when our building opens back up, we look forward to meeting you in person. But until then, we'll be right here every week, right on YouTube, right on Facebook, streaming uh, this word. So welcome. We would love to have you. For those of you who are um, joining us for the Lord's Supper, now is the time to go and get your elements. Go and get your elements. Take of the Lord's Supper. The Holy Communion. You want to talk about why we can't have no Lone Ranger Christians? What is communion? Communion, community, people of common unity, fellowship. Koinia. That, that's, that's the word in Greek. It's, it's fellowship. Um, it's a family meal where we are remembering what Jesus did for us at Calvary. That's what this bread represents. It represents his body that hung on the cross for our sin. Um, suffered, bled, died, um, 
spear stuck in his side, a crown of thorns on his head, nails driven through his, his hands and his feet, beaten beyond recognition, sped apart, jailed, bruised, broken for you and I. So when we partake of this bread, we're remembering the sacrifice of his body, that Calvary, and what he did for us, how he hung up on that cross for us. So let us take the bread, let us eat together. This grape juice, or whatever kind of juice you're drinking, it represents his blood that was shed. The Bible teaches us that without the shedding of blood, there could be no remission of sin. That means that if he never shed his blood, we would never be forgiven. Our sins would have never been atoned for. It would have never been purchased, it never been paid for. You can't afford to pay for your own sin and I can't afford to pay for mine. Only Christ could because only he was perfect. All right? Only, only a perfect sacrifice can atone for sinful people. That's what this grape juice represents. It represents his blood that was shed. When we drink this, this uh, juice, we're remembering that his blood was shed for us. At Calvary's cross, we remember that without it, we could never be forgiven. And we are just so thankful of it. So that's what this represents. Let us drink together. Our Father and our God, we thank you. We praise you, we glorify you, we magnify you. We give you all the glory and honor and praise that you deserve. Lord, bless our homes. Remove this long range of Christian mentality from our churches. And infuse your church with power. Infuse your church with Boldness, infuse your church with a spirit of togetherness, a spirit of family, a spirit of fellowship, not just so that we can sit and have a fellowship dinner. That's important. But you've also given us a mission to work together, to spread the gospel together, to go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We are supposed to be the example in our communities. We're supposed to be the example in our neighborhoods. We're supposed to be the example in our homes. We're supposed to be the examples on the job. We're supposed to be the examples in our schools and in our churches and places of worship and our politics and our government and entertainment. At every sector, private or public, every entity, we're supposed to be representing Jesus Christ, we're supposed to be repping the kingdom. We are kingdom citizens. We are ambassadors for you. And we should be doing that together. Give us that spirit right now, God, in the name of Jesus. We pray with thanksgiving. Amen. That is my time for the day, family. I love you and I thank God for you and praise God for you. Um, just to let you know, uh, I'm <clears throat> taking a break. <laughs> I, I need a vacation. I haven't been, um, haven't taken a break in, I don't know, 20 months, uh, almost two years now. So I'm, I'm taking a break, taking some much needed rest. Uh, got to take care of myself so that I am, um, so that I'm on point and sharp for you. Uh, soul care and self care is just as biblical as sacrifice and selflessness. Um, and so I, I got to take a break and get away, but continue to join us. We still gonna have church. The word is still gonna go forth. I got some powerful preachers lined up um, for the next few weeks for you. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, but this this will be my last Sunday until um, August, the second or third Sunday in August. I'll be back. I can't remember which one right now, but I'll I'll be I'll be back in in, um, in the middle of August. So. Um, so for the next few weeks, you'll you'll have some somebody else I have in mic, but the word is still gonna go forth. I wouldn't put nobody before you who couldn't who couldn't handle the word. You already know that because I love you. 
um, and I only want what's best for you and I only get the best for you. And so uh, I pray that you would still tune in. I pray that you would still watch and that you would give those preachers your the same respect and undivided attention like you give me because they are God's um, they are God's chosen as well. Um, and uh, the word is still going to go forward. But I thank God for you. I'm praying for you. I look forward to seeing you upon my return. I love you. Um, and I pray that heaven will smile upon you. God bless you and God keep you. You guys continue to enjoy your summer. And I'll holler at y'all when I get back. Peace.